And so uh, we just sincerely want this to be a place that you can just come. In fact, we thought it would be a cool idea if there's things that you, maybe you don't want to share that, or maybe didn't, you got questions that weren't covered by some of those things, if you could just write some of those down. we got some paper and pens. Any of those things that you're like, man, I wish they would kind of figure out. I've always wondered about this. Uh, we wanted to give you some time to write those out, and then um, there'll be, there's a box by the door on your way out. Drop it in there, and we're going to do our very best to answer them either um, in another session or on Facebook or just in some way. So you can keep it anonymous, but we'll just, we'd love just to tackle the questions. Because here's the deal, we know that there are answers, and, and I think uh, sometimes those answers might surprise you. I once met a detective. He's a uh, kind of a cold case detective, and, um, and basically, if you don't know what that means, he just goes and like tries to... Uh, solve these cases that are really, really old and using some of the new technology that we have today. But here's what he said. He said that anything in his line of detective work, anything is possible, right? But his job is not to find out what's possible. In the cold case detective world, his job is to discover what's probable and what's reasonable. What makes the most sense given the evidence? And so tonight we're looking at the question that you may have thought, couldn't be answered like this. And it's, it's how can we be sure God actually exists? Is there evidence for that? So we're going to present evidence this month and next month as well um, that's outside of the Bible and present what are called arguments. And I don't really, really like the term arguments because I think that arguments are something that generally people are trying to win. And, and that's not what we're trying to do here. We don't want to uh, win an argument. The goal tonight is just to see that becoming a Christian or being a believer doesn't mean losing your mind or checking your brain at the door. But the evidence for God is actually what's reasonable. And so if anything, you'll just take one step closer in investigating things out for yourself. Just a little closer. So tonight's message is, is part one of two. We had so much stuff that we just couldn't fit all in in one night, so uh, we had to split it up. So we'll finish next month with part two. There's a, uh, a late, late astrophysicist and cosmologist um, named Carl Sagan, and he once said that the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. It's a pretty definitive statement, isn't it? The cosmos is all there ever was or will be, leaving no room for a creator uh, really, or anything supernatural. In fact, today there's a large amount of ideas from a group called the New Atheists, and there's stuff everywhere. I remember when I was in college, I had to go around this gigantic book display that was in the middle of the, of the uh, bookstore in, in the college that said, uh, The God Delusion, by probably one of the most influential atheists today, a guy known, known as uh, Richard Dawkins. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's him, there's, um, there's people like the new atheist Sam Harris who wrote a book called The End of Faith. And if you ever wondered, like, well, what are those guys, how do they really feel about God? You could just uh, look to the late Christopher Hitchens, whose best-selling book was titled God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. There's not much room there for confusion. So when you see like really smart people like that, I mean, between those guys, there's a lot of intelligence, right? And there's also, there's a lot of funny internet memes with those guys saying things that make Christians look stupid, right? And you see their work so prominently displayed, it, well, it can make you wonder, how can one be confident God actually does exist? So I want to address that tonight. Why should anyone believe in God? Is it just a hand-me-down, you know, is faith just a hand-me-down from your parents, is it a blind leap into a, a set of beliefs for which there's no evidence? Or are there answers out there? So tonight we're going to try to do that without using the Bible. Which, by the way, I think there is an important time and place for sharing what the Bible says, and we'll get to that in uh, months to come. But tonight I want to appeal to sources that you might already trust, like science, like reason and personal experience. So that's what we're going to look at in these next two sessions. Time short, so we're going to go as deep as we can, as fast as we can. And I can tell you this, it's not going to be deep enough, but I believe it'll help give us all a greater understanding, a start of why faith in God makes the most reasonable sense. And I'm going to provide some links for you to go deeper on your own when you have more time. Okay, you guys ready? Let's do it. All right, the first reason to believe in God is based on the branch of science called cosmology, which is the study of the origin, structure, and development of the physical universe. The reason is commonly referred to as the cosmological argument. I want you guys to watch this clip, and then I'll recap it. The 
Does God exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic, you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin, prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. Pretty, uh, pretty awesome video. That's by Dr. William Lade Craig and his ministry called Reasonable Faith. And you can find that, um, any video we show tonight and, and more at, www, at reasonablefaith.org. So, man, check that out. Here's a quick summary of what they just said. There's three lines of logic in that argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And, you know, and, and just kind of because I need to process the things, um, just, just what we just saw you know, things don't pop into existence. Kind of whatever begins to exist has a cause. Think of something in life. Something in life that you can, I mean, anything, right? There, there's, there's just, there's a reason for everything that you see. You think of, of crushing credit card debt, right? And you know that the reason for that was somebody went crazy with the credit card. It didn't just happen, although I would be awesome if you could say that, right? Herpes. 
didn't just happen. There's a cause for every single thing. They don't just pop in. So I'm just saying that science operates on this principle that every event requires a cause. In fact, Albert Einstein once said it like this. The scientist is possessed by a sense of universal causation. This, agrees, this principle agrees that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now, maybe this is an objection that comes up in your head, and, and maybe this is where you're at. Like, well, if everything needs a cause, well, then who caused God? But that's a misunderstanding of the argument itself. It does not claim that everything needs a cause. It only says that everything that has a beginning needs a cause. But here's the deal. God is eternal and had no beginning. God does not need a cause, nor does he have a cause for his existence. But that's, that's another night. So if everything that did begin to exist needs a cause, that leads us to the second point they made, that this observation that the universe began to exist. And almost the entire scientific community acknowledges this fact that the universe came into existence. Cosmologists often refer to this as the what? The big, big bang, yeah. The late Stephen Hawking, a physicist, also an atheist, summed it up like this. He said, almost everyone now believes the universe, even even time itself, had a beginning at the big bang. But see, science is not the enemy of Christianity. Science is the Christian's friend because science is simply pointing out that in the beginning, God said, bang, and it was big. It's just him. What if God used that colossal event to start it all? Or more accurately, God started it all, and what we look at is the evidence left over. We simply call the big bang. So once we've seen that, you know, that whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist. This leads us to that necessary logical conclusion that therefore the universe has a cause. And the universe calls for a cause that's bigger than it to create it, much bigger outside of the physical universe. The Big Bang, from a Christian point of view, sounds like a scientific description of the biblical doctrine that theologians have said for centuries, which is creation ex nihilo which literally means that God made everything out of nothing. By the way, uh, Einstein and many other atheist thinkers, they initially resisted this idea of of the universe having an origin point. You know why? Because of the theological implications that came with it. Because if it started from somewhere, then whoa, that gave way too much support to the idea of a supernatural creator. And they fought against that until they had to follow the facts where they led. And I think... You know, as, as good, open-minded thinkers, we should do the same thing. Don't you agree? This is just happens to lead us back to God. Here's another reason that we should be looking uh, to God, which we'll look in greater detail next time, but um, next month. But this is something called the fine-tuning argument, and I love this. It's, it's that the fine-tuning of our universe, how it appears that someone dialed everything in, like these, there's like 50 constants of the, that make up our, our known earth, and, and, and all these things have been there's impossible precision and coincidences for life and matter. But we'll get to that next month. The last one I want to focus on tonight is, is our sense of morality. And it's that our sense of morality points us to God as our moral law giver. Look, we all, we all know that, that kicking puppies, that's not okay, right? And, and like, we know that rapists should go to jail. We, we all know that, but how do we know that? More importantly, why do we universally know that? Let's take a look and see if we can be good without God. Can you be good without God? Let's find out. Absolutely astounding. There you have it. Undeniable proof that you can be good without believing in God. But wait. The question isn't, can you be good without believing in God? The question is, Can you be good without God? See, here's the problem. If there is no God, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. And here's why. Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. But if there's no God, there's no objective reference point. All we're left with is one person's viewpoint, which is no more valid than anyone else's viewpoint. This kind of morality is subjective, not objective. It's like a preference for strawberry ice cream. 
the preference is in the subject, not the object. So it doesn't apply to other people. In the same way, subjective morality applies only to the subject. It's not valid or binding for anyone else. So, in a world without God, there can be no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. God has expressed his moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. For example, God's essential attribute of love is expressed in his command to love your neighbor as yourself. This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. And we can condemn as objectively evil greed, abuse, and discrimination. This raises a problem. Is something good just because God wills it, or does God will something because it is good? The answer is neither one. Rather, God wills something because He is good. God is the standard of moral values, just as a live musical performance is the standard for a high-fidelity recording. Without your love. The more a recording sounds like the original, the better it is. Likewise, the more closely a moral action conforms to God's nature, the better it is. But if atheism is true, there is no ultimate standard. So there can be no moral obligations or duties. Who or what lays such duties upon us? No one. Remember, for the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. The cat's just being a cat. If God doesn't exist, we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real, oh. our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, Hey, that's not fair. That's wrong. That's an injustice. You affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. We're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination, and terrorism are wrong for everybody, always. Is this just a personal preference or opinion? No. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. What all this amounts to then is a moral argument for the existence of God. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Atheism fails to provide a foundation for the moral reality every one of us experiences every day. In fact, the existence of objective morality points us directly to the existence of God. It's pretty awesome. Our morality shows that there's an objective standard that we each look to. And it's a standard, right, that came to us that's not from us. Because think about it, right? Humans would never invent a moral code that we could never fulfill and then use it to frustrate ourselves and condemn ourselves and each other all of our lives. We would never do that. That would make no evolutionary sense for that to happen. It just shows that, that we believe that there is an objective morality because all of us can point out when we know someone's done something wrong, when we know somebody is in the wrong. C.S. Lewis, in, in, in his book, Mere Christianity, he, he says it like this. He says, whenever you find a man who says he does not believe in a real right and wrong, you'll find the same man going back on this a moment later. He might break his promise to you, but if you try breaking one to him, he'll be complaining, it's not fair. It seems then we're forced to believe in a real right and wrong. People may be sometimes mistaken about them, just as people sometimes get their sums wrong, but they're a matter of mere taste and opinion any more than the multiplication table. See, Lewis is, is right about this because basic morality is not a matter of personal opinion. It's objective, like, it's like math. It's not subjective, like preference. 
You know, they, they use that, that, that um, illustration of ice cream. You know, one person can prefer chocolate ice cream, another person can, can prefer vanilla, but morality isn't like that. And if an adult chooses to physically or sexually abuse a small child, we don't regard it as exercising personal preference. We know that it's morally wrong. It's not like choosing an ice cream. Now, some people argue that our, our culture is what sets our moral sense, right? And that's it's partially true for some things. For example, you know, in, in Illinois, if you're driving on the speed limit, if you go over 65 miles an hour, then you should feel guilty because you're breaking the law. But in other states like Kansas, you can go like, like 108. I don't know what the speed limit is, but it's, it's flat and it's forever. You can just drive forever and, and, and without any sense of shame because it's different. But we do, as a matter of fact, have a moral sense that goes beyond mere culture. I want you guys to think about Adolf Hitler. His final solution to eliminate the Jews was embraced by the entire Nazi party. Germany accepted this within their culture and their laws, that the world was morally justified in condemning these actions. The fact is, our moral criticism reveals an objective morality that is above any particular culture. And if murdering innocent people is wrong in your home, certainly it's wrong in the home across the street, and it's wrong uh, on the other side of the town, and wrong where they speak other languages. It doesn't matter where someone commits murder, it's just wrong, period. And we all know that. But where do we get this sense of right and wrong? If we didn't invent it, if it goes past and transcends culture, if it's something we can't get away from, then what is its source? Could it be, and isn't it, isn't it reasonable that a moral lawgiver actually knit those moral standards into the very fabric of our humanity. And this conclusion, it's, it, it squares with logic and with experience. And interestingly, it's also something the Apostle Paul said in his letter that he wrote to the churches in Rome when he said that they show the work or the requirements of the law is written on their hearts because he says this, he says their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts either accuse or even excuse them. Because we didn't create it, and we can't escape it. And our consciences, they convict us of it. An objective moral standard given from a moral law giver. Now, there's so much more that could be said, and I'm excited for part two of the message next month. Because the fact is, there is plenty of reasons to believe. And the evidence from, from these three arguments alone, uh, one of which we'll talk about next time, points strongly towards the existence of God, a God who started this immense universe with a bang, a God who fine-tuned that universe to precise, extreme tolerances so it would support life, including yours and mine, and a God who is perfectly good, who created us with a deeply embedded sense of morality. Now, those are good arguments. Whether or not I've presented them well, that's, that's something else. But those arguments are powerful, and I know that because Lee Strobel and Mark Middleberg, they're two of the apologists that helped shape this Room for Doubt series, they hosted a, a debate between a prominent atheist named Frank Zindler and um, a well-known apologist, Dr. William Lane Craig, for, for Christians. And um, they held this debate at a church in Chicago. And get this, nearly 8,000 people showed up to see this debate in Chicago. 8,000. And the debate was on the question of whether or not God exists. And Dr. Craig used these same arguments that I presented tonight and that you'll hear next month, but in greater detail. But listen, at, at the end of the event, they took a vote, and when the numbers were tabulated, 97% of the attendees, 97% said the case for God was stronger. Now, you might expect that if those were all Christians right there in the church, but listen, hundreds of people indicated on the ballots that they were not Christians. And 82% of those who were not Christians said the case for God was stronger. And by the end of the night, 47 of those people became followers of Jesus. Evidence for God is strong and it's convincing. And listen, if you still have doubts after this, man, we would love to talk through this. Remember, the whole design of tonight is just to be a place where you can come with questions and, and, and just kind of think through things at your own pace. But here's what I want to encourage you. I just don't, I, I don't let your doubt stop you from, don't let it just be an excuse to not take you where the facts actually lead. You know, we can be confident that God exists and that he loves you and that he wants you to know him and follow him. And, and these truths that we're going to talk about in greater detail next time as well point to the existence of, of, of listen, a relational God, God that actually cares about you. 
If you're a Christian, you can stand confidently on these truths. And if you're not, I urge you to look into them seriously and follow the evidence wherever it goes. And I'm confident to lead you not only belief in God, but faith in Jesus. Listen, guys, uh, be sure to come back next month, November 10th. All right, November 10th. Put that in your calendar for part two of this message. That is the second Saturday of the month. We hope you check it out. Um, this message was adapted from Mark Middleberg's book, Confident Faith, as well as the, the question, Christians Hope No One Will Ask, along with the Room for Doubt leadership team from Lincoln Christian University. So I hope you guys enjoyed it tonight. Um, we will see you next month. And listen, do me a favor. Uh, if, if you're kind of trying to figure things out, get quiet with God sometime or just, you know, with yourself or whatever. You know, just get quiet out loud or in your head, maybe when you get home. But I want you to just do this, just to, to whisper to God. And say, God, if you are real, would you reveal yourself to me? If you're real. Look, if you're sincerely seeking, you have nothing to lose. At the very worst, you're just talking to your ceiling. And no one would know because you're by yourself, right? But at best, well, let's just say, I know that that's a prayer that he wants to answer. So be prepared. We're going to see you guys next time. The band's going to play uh, another song, but you are dismissed. Feel free to stick around and talk or head out as you like. Make sure you stop by the photo booth and get a picture out there. But um, you guys, we just thank you. We can stick around if you want and listen to this song, or you can uh, take off. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks for coming out tonight.